So our next speaker is Kala Svarup, who uh, received his bachelor's and master's degree in 2016 at the University of Memphis in mathematical science and is currently working on his dissertation in particle physics at Temple University. He gave a talk on the coronal heating problem at uh, BIHS 2019 Consciousness and Science Conference. The title of his talk is Sankhya and the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. So I'll, I will let Carlos Root take it away. All right, so we'll go ahead and, and reconvene. And um, I, uh, I won't repeat the full introduction of Carlos Root. But it um, sounds like a very interesting talk, and the title of his talk is Sankhya and the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. So please, Kala Svarup, take it away whenever you are ready. Okay. All right. Can everybody see my screen, and can everybody hear me? All right. I'm seeing thumbs up and from different places, so that's good. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about Sankhya and the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. Uh, so the general idea and what I was going for uh, is kind of having the Sankhya system as underlying quantum mechanics or as a uh, kind of layer under quantum mechanics. Uh, I thought about several different models, uh, one of which I'm going to present today. It's not a complete model yet. Uh, it's more, um, you know, some ideas about how we could go about making a model with uh, you know, the Sankhya, specifically the five Mahabhutas, as foundational properties in uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, so, yeah, just to um, reiterate or emphasize the point, this is not a complete model that's made to explain everything. This is more just to open up discussions and see uh where we go with it so this is based on something called wolfram models so i will start by uh just introducing what wolfram models are and kind of the general idea since they're relatively new and not yet necessarily well known throughout even you know the technical world uh, and then after that i will talk about the connections uh with sankhya and the mahabhutas so Wolfram model, it's a uh, minimal class of models, meaning that uh, it doesn't really take a lot to be a Wolfram model. There's a uh, you know, very minimal definition of it. And it's based on networks. And it was made uh, by Stephen Wolfram um, of Mathematica fame to uh, provide a path towards fundamental physics. And it's basically a similar idea to cellular automata. So basically, cellular automata are uh, systems, simple systems with local rules. So if you define it on like a grid or something, it only cares about what's next to it. And you can get all of these uh, interesting um, emergence phenomena out of cellular automata. And the key difference is that while most cellular automata uh, work on a predefined background or topology, basically a notion of connectedness. Usually that's some sort of grid, uh, square grid. Wolfram models, the whole point is that they can change the connectedness in the network. Uh, so here's kind of just a basic example. Um, so basically it's a network with a predefined set of update rules. And these rules take uh, the form of relations between sets. So here's an example of a rule that we have. Um, the labels are just there to label things. They don't have any other meaning. Um, so basically what this rule says, if we start with something like this, where we have one node going to two other nodes, then it changes into a network like this. Oh. Yeah. So basically, what this rule says, if we have a network like this on the left, it changes into one on the right. And by, uh, if you notice that the same sort of situation described in the uh, initial state of this rule is still present in the final one. So you can apply 
the, these sorts of rules again and again, and you get all these very complicated structures uh, that um, you know, take on these more complicated uh, topo network topologies. Uh, and you can also have other aspects. So these graphs just have edges. They're just normal graphs. But you can also have uh, hyper edges involving three or more uh, points. You can have self loops. Uh, you can have more than one edge between two points. So these are very general uh, classes of models. Um, there's also a notion of causality. So kind of you have points uh, kind of being responsible for the creations of other points. And that's encoded in this uh, causal graph. So A is connected to B if the input to B is the output from A. Uh, and this you can kind of think of as for the physicists in the room as analogous to a light cone. You know, it tells you what prior events can be uh, causally related to. Uh, and you know, these can be shown to have all sorts of properties that can be connected with physics. You can have basically forms of relativity in there, uh, special and general uh, elementary particles, quantum mechanics, things like that. And a lot of these actually don't depend on the specific rules that you care about or that you uh, have for the network. A lot of these are actually very general in the class of models uh, itself. So now the connections with Sankhya. So the big problem with Wolfram models is that uh, in a certain way, they're too general, as in you can write down any sort of rule that you want uh, and get something. You can actually, if you like, you know, download Mathematica, define some rules, and then go register your universe on uh, you know, wolframphysics.org. Uh, so everybody can have a chance to be Lord Brahma. Uh, <laughs> So uh, the basic idea or the way that uh, I was thinking is that you know, we have these five Mahabhutas. Then we think of these as underlying properties uh, that underlie kind of the physical or the types of physics that we uh, normally have. We can use these to guide what sorts of rules uh, we have. I'm not going to uh, show any specific rules because I don't have them yet. Uh, this is more just like a general idea of what sorts of rules we would need uh, based on kind of how I've been understanding it. But of course, I might be wrong in my understanding or uh, there might be better ideas. So there are five Mahabhutas, starting with uh, ether, the Akash, um, kind of loosely translated as space. Uh, this top um, quote is from the Bhagavatam. Uh, 26th chapter of the third canto when Lord Kapila is talking about the material universe. Uh, and basically that the characteristics of the Akash is that it uh, is the accommodation of room for everything. So that seems to be a uh, uh, analog of space kind of or the underlying substrate that all of these are kind of defined upon. It's not necessarily uh, equated with the space-time of relativity. Uh, once you start getting space-time and the laws of relativity and it can get a bit more complicated. But generally speaking, conceptually, the Akash is just the network itself, the underlying uh, structure. So then air, um, it's exhibited by you know, mixing, allowing the approach of objects uh, and other perceptions. Um, so it can be thought of the idea of currents, uh, and through this uh, idea of Noether's theorem, which is a theorem in physics, uh, there are connection between these conser conservation laws or conserved currents and symmetry groups. Uh, so you can think of basically symmetry groups as what transformations I have that leave the thing the same. So if you think of a square, you can you know, rotate at 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, or do nothing. Uh, and that forms a mathematical structure called a group. The ones that we use in physics are a bit more complicated than that. Uh, 
but you can think of you know this principle or this property uh, either being a rule in itself or being kind of the idea that our rules have to obey these symmetries uh, because we know pretty well symmetries that uh, quantum fields obey. Uh, you can also get ideas of mass. Um, you know, there's these types of relations. Of course, a lot of them are more complicated than this, but that you know, some types of correlation lengths depend on mass. So you can see kind of how these stable structures, which you can uh, think of as particles, travel throughout space. So these pictures down here are not Wolfram networks. Oh, they're from uh, Conway Games of Conway's Game of Life, which is a uh, early example of cellular automata. And these are called gliders, which are stable structures throughout time. So I actually have a little animation anybody can see of Conway's Game of Life. So you see these gliders, they're stable throughout time and uh, kind of traveling through space. And even these larger structures up here, they're, you know, in a sense, the entire structure can be seen as moving through space. So if you think about this as kind of an abstract representation of a physical reality, we have two large particles coming together and giving off smaller particles. So basically it's an abstract representation of a particle accelerator. So that's kind of the idea that you can get these fundamental particles. Uh, so then fire, you could think of as being energy levels, uh, at least quantization, um, which could be conceptually kind of a core structure, the, which is the ground state, surrounded by a larger structure uh, that's energy levels that isn't as stable because everything goes back to the ground state. Uh, the next two elements, water and earth, are a bit more difficult conceptually to uh, figure out, but I have an idea. Uh, maybe we can discuss if people like it. Uh, it's a bit hard because, you know, this description in the Bhagavatam up here has things like slaking thirst and, uh, you know, maintaining life, which is hard. It's hard to slake the thirst of a particle. Uh, but, you know, it also says, you know, coagulating various mixtures. So I think it could possibly correspond to interaction. Uh, so... Um, in fundamental physics, these are given by Lagrangians. So you might need a rule that tells you what sort of interactions are okay. So this is an example of an interaction in quantum electrodynamics uh, or QED. And the QED Lagrangian has terms that say, okay, if you have an electron and a positron um, hitting, it can, it can produce a photon, or basically that these types of vertices are allowed to exist. Uh, so basically the idea is that, you know, the water principle or property would be these rules defining interactions. Uh, Earth was also kind of difficult to get your head around, um, but basically it's the property of order is what I was thinking. Uh, as physicists, we usually think in terms of entropy, which is kind of the opposite of order or a dual uh, uh, concept. And this could kind of get us from uh, fundamental physics to classical physics, what we see, because the laws of quantum mechanics are time reversible or almost time reversible, depending. There's some debates with the weak force, I believe. But uh, generally, if you, in the laws of quantum mechanics, you know, going forwards in time and backwards in time, you can do both. Uh, obviously, classical physics isn't like that. If I smash a vase, a vase on the floor, I can't unsmash the vase. So uh, it's possible that kind of the Earth principle um, is uh, for that. Of course, strictly a second law argument, a second law of thermodynamics argument would say that this always needs to decrease, uh, that order needs to decrease, our entropy needs to increase. Uh, we might need to 
go a bit outside that because we obviously see lots of order in the universe and we need to figure out how it got there unless it's from a highly ordered initial state. Uh, so here are some possible connections with cosmology. I'm not a cosmologist, so I might be off on some of these. Um, so this could be a model for how the various elements were manifested in cosmogenesis according to the Bhagavatam and things like that. Uh, since each element depends on the one before. So you can't have the air or the stable structures without the underlying substrate. You can't have energy levels without a particle to have energy levels around. Uh, so there's also this notion of uh, effective dimension calculated by the volume of a ball, which basically means if I go to one of these structures and look at a point, uh, if I have R equals one, I look at all the points one away from it, uh, and I can count those. And then I can count the ones that are two away from it, uh, et cetera. And that grows uh, approximately as R to the D. And whatever D you choose is the effective dimension. But uh, because these uh, graphs can be arbitrarily complicated, you can have different effective dimension at different points. So, you know, sometimes we talk about, you know, the higher planets being higher dimensional. So that we could have one kind of effective dimension on the earth planet and another, uh, you know, the higher planets. Uh, it's possible that the effective dimension of the early universe uh, could be quite high uh, and then kind of go to the one that we all uh, approach what we all know today, um, which could have higher amounts of causality in the early universe than is expected, you know, with these correlations. Uh, we could correspond to the, these could correspond to different uh, cosmologies, you know, expansionary, static, cyclic. Uh, it's possible that the rules indirectly depend on the size of the total network, meaning that the bigger network you have, the more you're growing which is basically accelerating expansion, which is uh, we usually attribute to dark energy. Uh, so there's still other questions. Um, the biggest one is probably how do we go from, from these concepts to specific rules that I can write down and put in a computer and see what I get. Uh, it's possible that the idea of causal graphs uh, could help understand karma. Um, you know, kind of having causality across uh, space and time. Uh, it's possible that, you know, the yogis with mystic powers could actually be manipulating uh, things at this level uh, and kind of having it grow. Um, one of the biggest questions as well is, can I use this to model known physics? You know, can I take one of these models and get a neutrino out of it? or a quark. Once I do that, am I, does it also predict new physics? And once I'm able to recreate the standard model, so to speak, uh, is it predicting other particles that we might be able to uh, try to find? Um, and then is there a way to take a continuum limit in order to get a field theory? Because this is obviously discrete, uh, but sometimes continuous uh, models uh, are useful as well. Uh, and some of us just like field theories. Uh, so that's basically the idea that I have. Um, thanks for listening. If anybody wants to learn more about these Wolfram networks, not necessarily the Sankhya part of it, uh, you can go to <laughs> wolframphysics.org. <laughs>